Hello, this is Anne de Gais from Anne Inside. This is December the 18th, 2020. And this is an inside channel on YouTube. We have two videos this week, and uh, they're both really critical. On the first one, uh, we are going to see that the US is shattering all records. Uh, 250,000 daily cases on the average, uh, over 3.4 thousand people uh, who are dying on a daily basis. Uh, we, this is worse than a 9-11 on a daily basis. Meanwhile, Europe is bending the curve. It can be done. We need to do it. The US can do it. In the second video, the clinical one, uh, we are going to be looking at the vaccine's rollout, what's happening with the vaccination, who is going to get it, in what order, what are the problems in getting the distribution of logistics. Uh, two new at-home tests have been approved, so we're going to review that. And we'll do a quick review at the end on how to avoid being infected with COVID since the next couple of weeks are going to be horrific uh, for the U.S. So I also want to wish you uh, a really happy 2021. We cannot wait to get rid of 2020. Uh, please stay at home, be safe, and I'll see you on January the 8th, 2021. Thank you for listening and spreading the world. Thank you. Hello, this is Andy Gates, uh, and this is my second video on clinical update. Uh, lots of things happening there. If you missed my first video, we are shattering all the records in the U.S., so please take a look at my epidemiology video. Europe is doing a good job at bending the curve, but the U.S. is absolutely losing it. Uh, today, we're going to talk on the clinical video about the vaccines rollout, all the good news, what's happening there, who is going to get it, what are the issues. A new uh, at home testing have been approved, and we're going to do some recap on some new information on the disease. Let's do a quick recap on what we know about COVID. Uh, we know that the signature is a loss of smell and taste, and I want you to be aware of that because if that happens to you in the next several weeks when the surge is so strong, you really need to assume that you've been exposed. It is everywhere in the community. We thought this was a pulmonary infection and upper respiratory. We know it's an immune disease, so it has triggered a whole bunch of immune disorders there, uh, which unfortunately the long haulers have shown a lot of those problems, which is 10 to 30% of patients who have had COVID regardless of age and regardless of severity of the disease, end up with long-term problems with damage to the heart, the kidneys, and the lungs. So you have to take this seriously there. And if you want to know more about it, please watch my prior videos on this. It's quite a bit of information there. Uh, we know the, the vaccine has mutated. There's a new mutation has emerged in England. It doesn't look like it increased the fatality. It may increase the contagious rate, uh, but we keep an eye on that. But so far, none of the mutations are affecting the effectiveness of the vaccines. And we all know that uh, it's really the aerosol and the droplets that's where the contagious is spreading there. Uh, the ICU fatality has dropped from 25% to 7%, but we're afraid that it's going to go back up with the surge and the fact that the healthcare system are being overwhelmed. So, and what we don't know is how long this damage on the long COVID holders will last. We don't know. We have to wait which time. So a quick reminder there, when you get exposed, it may take three to four days before you have enough of a viral load that can be detected by PCR. And really the virus is within you maybe for maybe 11 to 14 days. After that, you get viral debris, which can still be tested by the PCR, but you're no longer contagious. So the area there is this area with the most contagious there, which is why we don't really capture it. And you can have a false negative with PCR. And this is when you really the most contagious. Uh, the problem we're having on the medical side is not the virus itself, it's a cascade it created with the immune dysregulation, what's called the cytokine storm, that basically create all those side effects. And unfortunately, if you start dropping your oxygen, which is called hypoxia, that's when you end up requiring any type of healthcare uh, in ICU and hospitalization. So please have a pulse oximeter. We've discussed this in the past. Anything dropping below 94%, you need to get uh, medical help. So news. A new article came out from the University of Edinburgh, and they look at 2,200 critically ill patients there, and they discovered that on a chromosome 3, there is a mutation that may explain why some people have significantly more severe outcome when they catch the virus. And this is called the gene IFNAR2. It's a mutation that's critical because it's, it creates this protein that help uh, basically make interferon. Interferon is your first line of defense when you get uh, a virus going into the body there. So what it seems to be noticing, and we've talked about this in the past, is that the first response of the body, uh, which is driven by interferon, is not activated correctly there. And so the virus duplicates and unfortunately gets to the point you get a really severe reaction there. 
So, so uh, more and more, we started to learn that there's some subpopulation there that maybe in normal life don't have a problem there, but unfortunately the virus is exploiting that weakness in, in that line of defense. Uh, another study just came out that was really interesting. They look at 132 VA hospitals, the veteran administration there at over 2000 patients there. And what they discovered is that we have a higher admission within 10 days after people got discharged from the hospital there. So if you get discharged from the hospital, it is really critical that you continuously to monitor yourself and you monitor your oxygen. And because 20% 20, 20 got readmitted after within 60 days, 9% of those died. So this is still a very high mortality rate. And 22% got readmitted to the ICU. And that's significantly higher than you will see for patients who have had pneumonia and heart failures. So if your loved one uh, is being discharged, you know, please keep a close eye on them. Uh, I won't spend too much time on that. I just want to remind you that there is this long COVID, uh, which is you know between 10 to 30 percent of the population there that does all those damage across the body there, and that is what should drive you uh, to really be careful not getting sick because it's not the mortality rate; it's really at the 10 to 30 percent chance that you may have long-term damage. That's what really should drive people to wear masks, be socially distant, all the good stuff we have talked before. So men have another a study just came out in Nature. And it shows what we've known in the past, that men have a 1.4 higher risk of death and a two times higher risk of hospitalization and a close to three times higher risk of ICU death. And again, I go back to some of the data uh, that people are speculating that this could be tied to something on the X chromosomes and a mutation there that again has, a, has an impact on the interferon. So uh, we, we're learning more and more that, you know, that why some population are at higher risk. Uh, COVID uh, it was the third leading cause of death, and literally in the last couple of weeks since this paper uh, got published, uh, we literally have drastically increased the mortality rate in the U.S. from when this paper was published uh, from 826 uh, to 2,000 deaths. Um, and again, we now, I've just showed you earlier, we've had 3,600 deaths. So that means with 3,600 deaths, COVID is now the deadliest cause. Uh, the leading cause of death on a daily basis there. We literally, uh, at 3,500 deaths per day, uh, it's twice the, the rate for cancer and close to twice the rate of, of heart disease. This is sobering. It's going to get worse in the next several weeks. You really, really need to be careful there. Another study, which I didn't spend too much time on, but showing for the younger population there, the mortality rate has gone down drastically compared to 2019. So COVID, although you have a lower chance of dying, is still killing young people there. So it's, you know, it's not just for the old people like us. Uh, super spreading event. You may remember in the February, uh, really early when the COVID started there, there was a famous conference done by a biotech company called Biogen in Boston. They had this two-day conference. And initially, we all talk about to say, oh, 99 people got infected. Well, they did some contact tracing and they followed those people there. And now they have tied it to 300,000 cases. I just go slowly there. That's 2% of all the US confirmed case came from that one super spreading event. And it went all the way to 29 US states, but also Australia, Sweden, and Slovakia. And the way they figured this out is that they did the genomics of that mutation there. And they were able to look at this specific mutation there that came from these 28 people that were initially infected at the conference there and track them across the globe. It's, a, it's an amazing paper if you love science there. But uh, this is, we need to do more of this contact tracing to understand, you know, where are the super spreading event and how the consequence. And this one is just astonishing, especially because it was a biotech company, but we're early and they did not know. Uh, another interesting paper just came out from John Hopkins and they look at using uh, infrared technology from the military. They look at what's happening when you have a mask and if you don't have a mask and what's the airflow. And of course, we all know we want to put a mask to limit the airflow. But what I did not know is this one, which is if the mask is poorly fitted, guess where all the air goes backwards. So what you really need to do is that don't be behind somebody that has a loose mask because all the air is like a jet engine going straight back at you. So, you know, uh, so not only look at the person in front of you, but really look at the people there that, you know, have these loose, and I see a lot of these people there where they have the mask kind of loosey-goosey, especially some of the surgical masks. So, so just be aware of your environment, look around, see, see, see what people are doing. 
Uh, a quick reminder of the progression of the disease for diagnostics is that you, this is when you get uh, exposed there, you have the incubation period of three to four days where PCR can give you false negative. And this is, you know, roughly around the like five or six, you start having positive PCR. And then after two to three weeks, it becomes negative. And this is the other test, which is the IgG is the antibody for people who have been exposed that usually peaks at 21 days and stays there. That's the, that's the one thing we're testing with the vaccine uh, for hopefully several months there. So, so, so let's take a quick look um, at, at some of this antigen testing. Now, remember the problem of this antigen testing, they can be up to 30% false positive. So if you turn positive, you have to do a PCR. Uh, and because that's the only way you can guarantee. And that's been a problem in nursing home because they got this buy, this antigen test from the government there. And then 30% of the time, these people were not sick and they were being isolated there. So that's one of the reasons that a lot of these nursing homes are no longer using this test just because it's creating uh, so much havoc in their workflow. So the good news, uh, two tests just got approved um, uh, in the last few days. Uh, the first one is a, the first test that's over the counter. That means you don't need a prescription. Uh, it was approved by a company called Illum, which came from Australia there. It's going to be uh, marketed for around $30 a the test. They plan to do 20 million tests by the first half of 2021. It's, it's called a, a rapid lateral flow antigen test. You know, these are the tests that shows that you're having a reaction because you've been exposed to the, to, to, to the virus. And, and basically they look at fragment of proteins of the SARS virus from a nasal swab. And this is interesting. It's for individuals over two years old. That's the first time I've seen something that for, for the children there. And you get the results within 20 minutes using your cell phone and they do the processing for the cloud. The interesting part is that if you have symptoms, they claim to be 96% correct if you have a positive sample and 100% correct if you have a negative sample. In other words, if, uh, if you think you are symptomatic and all of that and it turns negative, you don't have COVID. You may have a cold or something else, but you don't have COVID. If you have no symptoms, the sensitivity and specificity drops a little bit there, which is kind of uh, uh, unusual. And they claim only 91% positivity rate, which is still pretty good because some of the prior tests we've seen could be up to 20 to 30% false positive there. Again, if you have something that's positive, you should always get yourself confirmed with a PCR test. The other test I just got approved in the last few days is from a very large company called Abbott. And this is the name of it. You have to love the way they, they call their name. It's called the Binax Now, which is the AG car home test. It's the same type of lateral flow antigen testing. In this case, you have to get a telehealth supervision to do the collection of the sample. Uh, so it's not just something you can just do at home. You also need a prescription. It gives you the results like a pregnancy test. It's positive or negative. You can see this on, on the card here. And it's only legally authorized for individuals who have COVID symptoms. So much more restrictive than the other test is. Uh, they claim 91% sensitivity and higher specificity there. They're planning to build it up at 30 million tests by the end of March and they charge $25. Um, so let's look at vaccine. Uh, this is all what we've been waiting for. There's the light at the end of the tunnel and thank God it's not a train, at least we hope so. One of the issues that's going to emerge in the next coming months is who has access to vaccine. Remember, there's 7 billion people. I may be wrong. Maybe it's higher by now. I'm getting old. Uh, but what's happening is all the rich countries have been buying, pre-ordering the vaccine. And remember, if not everybody, if we don't get herd immunity on a global basis, this thing is going to come back uh, via airplanes. And so you can see Canada has done a really good job at pretty much covering their population there and buying you know, a, a lot of doses there. So is the US and the UK and the European Union. And the European Union has done a great job creating a, a, also a COVAX organization where the rich country are subsidizing uh, the vaccine for the poor countries there, which I think is what we need to do on the global basis. But you can see some of the poor countries and I call this upper middle income like Brazil, Indonesia and Mexico, they, they don't really have that coverage there. So we're going to get in the coming months in 2021, I think a political battle uh, and if, uh, you know, for access to vaccine. Uh, so we need to keep an eye on, on that. And so let's do a quick review of the vaccine. There's four, vac four types of vaccine. The mRNA, which is the one that's just got approved, uh, is really a new type of vaccine that has never been built in large production before. It's the first time they've been approved. 
And, and we'll, take, we'll spend a bit more time explaining how that works, but the big name is Moderna and, and, and Pfizer are the two ones that we, will know, uh, we know more about it. So let's talk about them. Uh, so if you look at immunization promised by income level, uh, you can see that, that uh, the, the Pfizer, which is this one, and the Moderna are not the one that people have made the biggest purchase order. The biggest one was AstraZeneca, which we'll talk about having some problem with their efficacy rate, followed by J&J, which is using a different technology there. So if you look at all the pre-order that have been done by high income countries there, you can see they've pretty much locked up the capacity of all the emerging vaccine coming up there. Gamalia is the one from Russia, and then we'll talk more about the, some of the Chinese one. So mRNA, uh, so there's no way you can get COVID from this vaccine. It doesn't take any piece from the vaccine, uh, from, from the virus. What they do is that they look at the spike protein. If you remember, this is the thing that attaches to the ACE2 receptor. That's how it enters the body there. This is called the spikes. And they take a piece of it that they artificially make. I insist, artificially make. This is, we're not taking the traditional vaccine and old vaccine and weakening it. This is something that's being synthesized. And, and, one of the, and then we basically fool the body in thinking that that piece of DNA uh, is basically something that's an invader and then the, the body responds to it and it creates the antibody. This mRNA are very fragile, so they have to be in, encased in lipid nanoparticles, another way to say fat. And one of the problems is that they melt at room temperature and that creates that supply chain you may have heard about. That's why the, the Pfizer there has to be shipped at really, really low temperature there because it needs the delivery, which is this lipid nanoparticles to basically be injected into the body. So if you look at Pfizer, they're starting to have some problem in the supply chain. Uh, the good news, they have 95% effect of efficacy, which is more than anybody expected. Uh, they have now a safety data for over 43,000 volunteers, which is quite high. And out of that, you can see that uh, they have uh, different numbers for people who are 65 years old. The efficacy is 94%, which is still pretty good. And you're going to see it's slightly different from Moderna. And they had a great diversification in the trial samples. 42% of people were racially diverse. And they had a, quite a bit of a population of elderly between 56 and 85 years old. So it was a very good sample, very, very good protocol there. Uh, the, the UK has approved the utilization for 400,000 doses for people over the age of 16 years old. And the US has approved it on uh, uh, the, the product there. It is being literally shipped across the country there. Here's the bad news, seven states were informed yesterday that their second shipment was being cut by 40%, including California, which has that huge spike we talked in the first video. And it's been unclear why, because Pfizer is saying they have millions of those on their shelf waiting to be shipped, and they're just waiting for the order uh, from, the, from the DOD, which is managing the distribution there. And the latest story is, is that there was a, a system called Tiberius that failed to update the latest projection. So they shipped this based on wrong projections. But six states, including California, uh, got, seven states got hit by that. And these are drastic cuts, so uh, not good. Uh, in addition to that, initially, uh, Pfizer was thinking they could do quite a bit uh, of doses, like 50 million doses worldwide by the end of the year. And of course, that's coming up quickly there. And they've cut this down by half just because they're having some supply chain problem in, in all the ingredients and then in, uh, in the shipping uh, that they have to do for their products there. So they still hope to do a billion doses in 2021. But this has to be kept at minus 70 degrees uh, Celsius there. So it has to be shipped in special container with dry eyes. They now have enabled all the containers to have thermal sensor with GPS so they can keep track to make sure that uh, this uh, vaccine don't drop below 75 degrees uh, Celsius. And that turns out to be a problem because it happened. It happened, uh, and, and we'll talk a bit more about it. It's coming up. Um, I think I'm going to go backwards. Uh, one of the issues is that you need to do two injections at 28 days apart for Pfizer's. And in the process, it's very unclear. Do we keep the dose and wait for you for 28 days, or do we give it to twice the amount of people and hope that we'll get another shipment in the next 28 days? And most people right now are taking the conservative one, which is you keep the storage. Uh, just because we're not sure about the shipment and the fact that the shipment just dropped by 40% what was expected there, you know, is probably adding to that worry there. And the problem is that you need to keep this, this, 
this, this vaccine under very cold temperature with very expensive freezer at 40 to $80,000 each, which are very hard to get right now. And you have to make liquid carbon dioxide uh, to maintain the dry eyes. It, when you defrost the, the vaccine, it has to be used within five days. Therefore, the logistics of bringing people and making sure you inject them because it's like you know 975 dose per batch, so you have to really be very organized and be able to do all those injections there. In Germany, for example, they're literally building 100 centers to inject 30 people per minute for 10 hours per day for six months. Uh, we love the Germans, they're very organized. This is another example of it. North America, we think we may need hundreds of centers there, but right now it's really left at the state and the county uh, uh, level. And so, so right now there's a bit of lack of organization there. And then we have the big concern is how do we reach out to this area in Asia there where we have sparsely population, uh, where uh, some of those diseases has started, like in Vietnam, for example. So uh, let's talk about that minus 70 degrees C, two trays of 975 dose each, so around 2,000 dose, have basically were tracked to have dropped below 92 degrees. Uh, and so as a result of that, uh, there's a perception that they, they may have been compromised, so they've been quarantined and replaced. Uh, in addition to that, uh, there is this, 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 this technology there that comes from a, a company in Iceland that keeps track of the temperature and the GPS. And for legal reasons there, Pfizer was disconnecting uh, that device when it arrived at the hospital for legal reasons because they no longer control what happens to this while they were taking the responsibility and the risk all the way to delivery there. And so suddenly we just realized this in the last couple of weeks. So everybody was scrambling there because a lot of the hospitals, they don't have this ultra cold freezer. And they were using this special packaging there for 30 days to store with dry eyes. And so they had no idea if the vaccine was compromised. So US Operation Warp Ski scrambled in mid-November and paid $25 million to this Icelandic company. So literally Pfizer deactivate that sensor and immediately, hopefully, it gets reactivated and monitored by the government uh, to just to make sure that these vaccine are safe. And I'm just sharing this to give you a, a sense of the amazing uh, logistics nightmare that this vaccination rollout is bringing. The good news, there's some good news, is that the way Pfizer has been filling up the vials, there's literally normally five doses per vial that's being shipped. What they have discovered when they do the when when the nurse basically pulled out that dose to the certain amount that they need, which are I think 100 microgram, is that they are able to get a six and in certain cases a seventh dose. And so the FDA and the government have basically made an exception just because it's such a short supply to allow those nurses to basically pull more doses from the vials that where they're labelly accepted by the FDA. Uh, and in addition to that, the government, which had been offered to buy 500 million doses in October and turned it down because they were negotiating, uh, basically uh, are trying to get another 100 million doses. But the bad news is the government uh, basically missed the opportunity because the Europeans basically bought the whole capacity between January and July of Pfizer. Um, and so, so one of the issues we're going to get is that we may get those first 100 million doses uh, but when do we get this for the second wave, which is most of us on this call? Uh, that's going to be an issue is that Q1, Q2 is going to be a challenge. Moderna, fantastic news. Literally half an hour ago, they got approved by the FDA on uh, uh, the Friday, December the 18th. They have some great uh, statistics there. They have 95% efficacy for people who are less than 65 years old, 94 overall, so very similar to Pfizer. A little bit lower for the people who are older. Uh, somehow they were able to keep track of it and it was only 86%, still amazing for a vaccine. So I wouldn't worry too much about that. They had 30,000 people in the trial. And that was the great news. They had no severe case in the vaccine group while Pfizer had uh, some severe case, not as many, but still had some severe case there. Uh, it shows very good safety. Um, uh, the cold supply chain is much easier. You can use a normal refrigerator, like around two to eight degrees C's, and you can keep it for up to 30 days after it's been thawed. And as opposed to Pfizer, you can only keep it for five days. So much easier to manage. And you can stay at room temperature for up to 12 hours where the Pfizer one can not stay at room temperature. So uh, much easier um, to use. They have 20 million doses that they, they're supposed to commit by the end of 2020. Now remember, if you divide this by two, uh, this is being given at 21 days apart uh, as opposed to 28 days. So make sure people don't get confused. 
um, and they hope that they can ramp up, but you know, this is a brand new manufacturing, to 500 to a billion dose. The government is in the process uh, of buying more doses from them. So just a quick comparison there. These, and I, I, these are all for the using mRNA technology. These are different mRNA molecules. You cannot you know, combine one versus the other. You cannot take one at first, the first dose and another one for the second dose. These are different molecules. They're roughly the same uh, efficacy, 94.5%, 14 days after the second dose. Uh, you know, uh, Dr. Fauci says you can get some immunity and protection after the first dose around 52%, but you really need that second dose and 14 days after the second dose before you have strong immunity there. As we talked about, the, the, the lipid delivery system there for injection requires this really cold temperature. And it looks like the Moderna has a better lipid, a different lipid than the one uh, from Pfizer. As a result of that, you can keep for 30 days in refrigerator versus five days for Pfizer. The dose are different. Uh, the dosage is 100 microgram for Pfizer versus 30 micrograms. Uh, so it's a smaller dose, but it's a different molecule. Big difference, 28 days versus 21 days. Just, just be aware of that. Uh, and this is the interesting part. Moderna was able to keep track in their trials of something that was different than Pfizer. And they showed that they reduced the amount of people asymptomatic after the first dose. So although you may still get uh, infected uh, you know, after the first dose because you don't have full coverage there, they noticed statistically that they had less people asymptomatic. Uh, slightly different uh, approval there. This is over the age of 18, over the age of 16. Side effects are roughly the same. Now, I need to talk a little bit for a second there about serious, rare, very rare side effects. It hasn't happened a lot. It's maybe three to four cases for each. Uh, in the case of Pfizer, there has been anaphylactic reaction there, which people recall an EpiPen. And, but these are people that when it happened to them, they had a history of severe allergic reaction there. So if you have a history of serious allergic reaction, you really need to talk to your physicians there and be careful with the Pfizer. Uh, uh, but otherwise the rest of the population is a very, very low incidence. In the Moderna, there has been a few cases of what's called Bell, Bell's palsy. This is when you have part of your face that's partially weakened or paralyzed there. Uh, we, um, and, and then these are the type of dose that the US has bought more doses from Moderna there and it's easier to handle. So we may see more of the Moderna in the Q1 than we may see of the Pfizer uh, uh, vaccine. So let's look at the second type of vaccine, which is the viral vector there. Uh, these are the one that from AstraZeneca uh, and J&J. &J. Uh, J&J has decreased their trials because there's such an infection rate in the US. They don't think they need 60,000 patients. They have decreased it to 30,000 patients because the infection rate is so fast that they can't get data very quickly. Uh, good news, bad news, unfortunately. Uh, and in this case, you know, they, they basically use a modified non-coronavirus, so like an adenovirus, which is like a cold. And they basically express the spike protein inside those virus to trigger that reaction. Again, I insist there's no way you can get COVID from those type of approaches. And, and so let's take, and it's a single dose, although AstraZeneca is moving to two doses just to improve their efficacy. So uh, this is fascinating news, which I think may be bad news, but that's just me. So AstraZeneca has shown in their initial results that they had only 62% efficacy at two full doses. Uh, and then they had these weird things where they made a manufacturing error and there was a group of around, I think, 1250 to 1500 people there who only got in the first door only half of the normal dose. It was just, you know, the vial wasn't filled up correctly there. And they had a higher efficacy, but they were younger. So as a result of that, uh, AstraZeneca had to go back to the FDA and kind of restart and changing their protocols uh, just to see, uh, you know, what the issue is there. The other thing that's concerning that just announced this week that they want to make a deal with the Russian Sputnik V vaccine, and they claim 90% efficacy there to basically combine the vaccines. What I mean by that is that you get one dose of one and the second dose of the other one. And they, there's a concern uh, that what's happening is there with this vector vaccine, which is different than the mRNA, what may be happening is when you inject one, the vector the first time, you create this antibody, and when you inject that second vector, you may have this antibody that basically attack the vector, and therefore you don't have that strong efficacy that they've seen with the mRNA. 
the whole by combining two different type of vector would have very would slightly different there that you still boost the antibody response but you don't have that negative response and for me the fact that astrazeneca which has sold billions of doses in europe and us they were the biggest one was the contracts in the pre-order is trying to combine a, a trials with the russians that tells me that they think they have a problem with that efficacy number there uh, so, uh, so that may be uh, something we need to keep an eye on. Uh, the Russian vaccine is called the Sputnik V, where they use the adenoviral uh, vector uh, vaccine, which is like the flu. And they use two common cold viruses that they combine together. It's the adenovirus 5 and 26, if you're in biotech. And then they put in there the, that genetic material, the spike, uh, just to get that, that response there. They claim a uh, very strong efficacy, but uh, you know, it's still, uh, we don't haven't seen the full trials results. These are small amount of trials there. They had 21 days between doses. Uh, they're in the middle of doing a full trial of 40,000 volunteers. We haven't fully seen these results yet, but they have approved the drugs and they're selling it to other countries. Um, let's look at the third category, which is inactivated vaccine. And so in this case, uh, they, they use a kill version of, a of the virus to generate the antibody. That's a more traditional way of doing vaccine. And that's being done by the Chinese. This is the way we do uh, the vaccine for hepatitis A, influenza, polio, and rabies. So when you get that flu shot, that's the way we normally develop. We take a, a, a inactivated part of that virus. So the Chinese vaccine, Sinovac, is one of the big ones there. Uh, they use uh, an inactivated form, so we know how to make it. Uh, it's killed, so you, there's no way you can get it. Again, very safe in that sense there. And they grow the virus in a petri dish, and then they weaken it, you know, using different technology there. It can be stored in a normal refrigerator, which is the good news. So Sinovac uh, had a study that came out in November 17, showing 97% efficacy, but that were only the phase one and two, which are really small trials. We really need to see the phase three data. Uh, and Indonesia is already starting to give it to 3 million doses. So I guess I mistyped this one. Uh, they have 3 million doses there, and they made a deal with Indonesia to manufacture 45 million doses uh, for, the, for the market there and also part of Asia. Uh, Sinopharm, a claim, which is another Chinese company there, claimed 86% uh, efficacy. I need to change my typo there. It's an over type of inactivated virus there. They're doing a trial uh, uh, in uh, Bahrain and United Arab Emirates, and they show very strong response. As a result of that, it has been approved by this country who have started distribution in their population there. Already a million Chinese have been vaccinated, which is pretty much every comp every employees who work in these companies, as well as the military. And uh, and so they're doing this on a on a what's called country scale uh, clinical trials. Uh, the fourth type is the protein base, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about Novavax, which is an American company there. And so in this case, you take a protein subunit. And it's like you use like a virus like nanoparticle there and you cover it with genetically engineered piece of the spike protein. Again, it's not a live virus. It's just pieces that artificially are being made that you basically attach that nanoparticle. In, the, in their cases, they use an insect virus called a baculovirus. And then they add to that the spike protein into a mast cells and then they create a protein. Then they add what's called an adjuvant, which is a super booster. Uh, and that's where you get the injection there. And this is the way we have done a, a lot of our vaccine, like the HPV vaccine or the, or the hepatitis B. Again, they expect two doses after 21 days. Uh, they're in the process of expanding the clinical trials in the, in the UK from 5,000 to 15,000. They expect the, the interim data in Q1 2021. And that's why I think I've been trying to tell everybody, we got these two mRNA that got approved quickly because they were so fast, but the rest of the other vaccine, we're not gonna get the, their data until late Q1. And so the question is, as we vaccinate all the healthcare workers, there's gonna be a bit of a gap. I think in, in getting more vaccine for the rest of the population there. Uh, European Union literally negotiated a deal yesterday uh, of 200 million doses uh, from Novavax. And this is in addition to all of those they already purchased from AstraZeneca, which we just explained may have an issue. JNJ, which is you know doing the clinical trials, the, the, the Pfizer, the CureVac. I mean, so everybody's piling up and doing a portfolio approach to basically see which one works. Here's the big problem. We need people to agree to get vaccinated. It's one thing to get the vaccine. Now we have to make sure we give it to get the herd immunity. 
So if you look historically at the percent of the population that agrees to be vaccinated, for people with the age of 65 years old, 70%, you know, get vaccinated. You know, they do a good job there. But if you look at the younger population there for the flu, it's, it's around 50%. And we need a higher number than that to get vaccination. So the big next challenge after we get this vaccine approved and we figure out how to make them and we figure out how to roll them in and get them to a center near you so you can get vaccinated is to get people to agree to be vaccinated. And so that's a massive logistic issue. So let's look for the numbers to give you some idea. We talked in the past about the r no, which is the reproduction number. So if one person gets sick uh, with, the, with the COVID and there is no restriction, they know nothing, how many other people do they get sick? And the flu is like a ratio of 1.2, 1.3. And then we've seen that uh, in certain area there, which was uncontrolled, a COVID could be as high as 2.5 to 4. Uh, the base prevalence is the percent of the population that's immune because they got vaccinated or they have antibodies because they've been infected. Okay. To give you an idea, it's estimated in late September that 9% of the American population had antibodies. And that's a paper that just got published by Stanford in Lancet. If we assume around 150,000 daily new cases, and I just told you we're at 250, so this is conservative, that means we have an extra 1.3% of the population there that's developing antibodies per month. If we want to hear, reach herd immunity, and we know the herd immunity has to be over 70% based on that R no factor there, how many months does it take to get there? So if the r no is three and there's no vaccination, i.e. we didn't do anything, uh, it will take until May 2025, which is the whole herd immunity of Sweden and all this, uh, this uh, you know, argument there is catastrophic because you will have a, you know, a few million people dying and we can absolutely cannot do that. If we have 90% efficacy of the vaccination, but only 39% of Americans, which is kind of the average of the, the flu vaccine right now, agree to take it, it will take 19 months or until December 2022. And again, these are all simplistic way of calculating, but it gives you the magnitude there. And that still means that 43% of Americans are still at risk and keeping that vaccine to get going. So in order for us, if we could just get 64% of the population to agree to be vaccinated by May 2021, which technically we may have enough vaccine to do that, we could achieve herd immunity you know, uh, by May 2021, and Dr. Farshi said maybe by Labor Day. Okay. So this is give you some idea of the numbers. Uh, uh, McKinsey did an interesting study there, again, doing looking at the efficacy of the vaccine, which thank God is very high, and then depending on the vaccine coverage, and it gives you an idea uh, on how much time it takes. So a lot of different ways of saying the same thing. We have to get the majority of the population to agree to be vaccinated. Here's the next issue. All the vaccines have been approved for adults. Adults is around 75% of the American population. We're just starting the trials to do vaccines for people less than 18 years old. And so we do need that because if we can, uh, if we only uh, vaccinate the adult population there, which is 70, 76%, we need 60 to 85% vaccine coverage, which may not happen in this political environment right now. And some of the issues about the vax are, you know, against, against vaccines. So we, we need two things. We need to encourage people to get vaccinated the same way that the New Yorker did. Uh, in 1947, I explained my first video. And the second thing is that we need to get the adult uh, vaccine to be adapted or, or basically approved for children. And this is what we're facing. The first in line is 17 million healthcare workers and 3.7 million nursing homes, roughly 20 million dose. These are the first dose that are coming down for 20 million people. That's multiplied by two for the doses. That's 40 to 45 million people there. That's the first batch that has been acquired there. That's you know probably going to be done by the end of Q1. And then this is where I think you're going to get a lot of issues across the country, which is who's second in line. Florida has, this, has decided that people at the age of 65 years old will be the first, uh, the first in line for the second rollout. Uh, California has decided that the essential worker and the teacher, the first responder, should be the first in line. You're going to see differences state by state or even maybe by certain counties there. And then, and then if you put the third in line, which is people with pre-existing condition and, and people who are healthy with our pre-existing condition over the age of 65, you know, then you start getting close to 100 million people on top of that. All of that needs to be multiplied by two. We don't have enough dose that we've pre-ordered for all those people there. So there's gonna be a lot of tackling uh, in, the, in the next few months. So the prioritized group is 142 million on top of the 20 million that's first in line. So that gives you the 162 million and the whole country you know, needs to be vaccinated at some time. So how do we do the distribution? 
uh, CDC has made a recommendation. There's around 40 million doses that they've pre-ordered. They thought they could get in December. It's clearly being delayed. And that's around 20 million people. It will go to all the healthcare workers. But to give you an idea, I just look in Santa Clara. I pretty much, on the average, every hospital in Santa Clara got one box of, of 984 doses or something like that. That is not a lot of people to be vaccinated in this hospital center there. So uh, there's a problem there with long-term care facility where some of the residents don't want to get vaccinated or are not legally competent to be vaccinated. So there's a lot of logistics there. So we are learning that the last mile may be a challenge. The second in line is going to be in February and March, and that was optimistic. I think it's going to be pushed, and these are the essential worker we just discussed. Third in line is healthy, non-essential worker. Fourth in line are the children sometime in late 2021. The state governor is making the decision. It's state by state. It's not federal. And we have noticed that 10 to 15 percent of notice, noticeable side effects, and that could be very high fever, up to 104 degrees for, for 24 hours. Uh, and, and people are, you know, basically have like a bad flu, you know, for 24 to 48 hours. So as a result of that, people are staggering the vaccination. So you don't do the whole department of the ICU at the same time, because then you, people may have to stay home for a couple of days. And where is it be? It's going to be in the doctor's office, in the hospitals, the pharmacy. They're working with CVS and Walgreens and, and uh, it's going to be a massive distribution. So to give you an idea, California has 37 million people, around 10% of the U.S. Uh, population there. We got 327 doses uh, last week, or I said beginning of this week. The shipment that was supposed to come next week dropped by 40%, despite the fact we have this huge spike. So these numbers are really low. And, uh, and then it goes this whole argument. It says, do we keep the second dose in storage or do we give it to everybody hoping that we can get another sets of those in four weeks there? And so there's, uh, the, uh, there's covid19.california.gov is the latest one, which they're literally still working on the guidelines there. So right now, what's clear cut is the acute care hospital workers, skilled nursing facility, paramedics and dialysis centers are just getting all the shipment right now but it's being you know, proportioned across the states. The local Walgreens and CVS pharmacies are working directly with the long-term care facility and, and skilled nursing facility to administer the vaccine. Um, and there is six regions in California there. Uh, you know, for us in Silicon Valley, we're region two, and we just got 80,000 doses. Most of the doses went to Southern California where we have that big hot center. Um, so I just yesterday looked to our congressman uh, from California called Mike Berman there, and he was interviewing uh, a, a person there called um, uh, Ivan Maldonado, who is a physician from Stanford, who is part of the uh, California uh, team that is making a lot of the decisions about this rollout. And, and pretty much what she says is going to be dark before it's done, i.e. the next several weeks are going to be pretty horrific to everybody because we won't get enough vaccine to really have an impact. Uh, she was stunned by the efficacy of the vaccine. Honestly, it's, 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 it, it surprised everybody how great they are. Uh, they said that if she felt pretty comfortable that we had a lot of non-white uh, in the population there so that you know, it was across all different uh, demographics. And, and what this is something I did not know is that they did a baseline for absence of, absence of antibodies on all the volunteers. So they knew before they vaccinated these people had not been exposed to COVID and they had never been asymptomatic there. They say that most people have a sore arm and then 10 to 15 people get this, this flu symptoms there for 24 to 48 hours there. We don't know yet is how long does it last. We absolutely don't know. Uh, we're going to learn as we go. And are you still contagious? And I think pretty much the belief there is that you may not get very sick, you may not get severe, but you may still get infected, which means you're still contagious. Therefore, you still have to follow all the guidance of wearing a mask, doing social distancing to prevent transmission there. Um, they do expect that we have to do an annual booster vaccine. They think that it's going to behave the same way that the flu vaccine works. So this is not a one time and get it over with. You know, this is going to be a new lifestyle. Um, and, and it says that right now, California just announced what's called the Vaccinate All 58 campaign, which is on their website, and where they come to the conclusion that we need to get 50 to 75% of the Californians to get vaccinated to get the herd immunity there. So uh, I ask a question and I says, when will the 65 and up uh, be, uh, be, you know, get access to the vaccine? They say the earliest will be March or April. So I figured that's going to be April. The general population will be after April there. So uh, the phase one B after the healthcare worker are going to be California made the decision to go uh, provide this to the essential workers and the teachers. 
Dr. Fauci and Sanjay Gupta were on a webinar uh, with Harvard that I was able to participate. The big takeaway there is that there's a perception that even after the first dose, uh, you can get 52% protection, 50, 52 protection 28 days after the first dose. So you really need a second dose to have the full 95% protection. And we absolutely need to educate the population. Even if you get slight side effect with the first dose, it's essential that you get the second dose after 28 days. Here comes what's called the Swiss cheese layer. Uh, this is a concept there. There's not a silver bullet to stop this virus. You need a multiplicity of protection. And if you've ever eaten Swiss cheese, you know there's little holes in the cheese. And if you just have like a filter, you just, there's this virus there that over time with all the different layers gets stopped. And it is a combination of wearing masks, and social distancing. We've talked about this in the, in the past, washing your hands avoiding being indoors and all these other things there. So uh, as far as educating the population there, we really need to educate. It is the combination of all of the above that protects you. And the next three to four weeks are, be, are going to be horrific. So please help your loved one, help you know, walk them through this, share this video if that well helps, and we need to educate them. So quick uh, reminder, we all are going to be exposed. It is everywhere in the community. The key is to avoid to be getting infected. Uh, a, a reminder, contaminated surfaces is not perceived to be low risk except high traffic door knobs and elevators. Uh, you have to really keep yourself into open air. The highest risk is the amount of viral load multiplied by the time you were with that person and the frequency you were that person. And, and the person yesterday from Stanford said that what they see in California, everybody's being contaminated by their household members. It is everywhere in the community or somebody they love and somebody they trust. So uh, look for uh, close up direct personal interaction there, you know, use common sense, watch out for the ventilation, air conditioning are horrible in circulating uh, the air and, and getting you more and more exposed. We've talked about this in prior video two weeks ago and watch out for super spreading event. Do, do the right thing to protect yourself. Wear a mask, uh, wash the ventilation at a distance, humidity right now. Uh, the lower the humidity, uh, which happens in, in, in heated uh, buildings there, that means the particle stays in the air longer period of time. So, uh, you know, watch my video on November the 6th. I spent quite a bit of time on explaining some of these. Uh, and remember the aerosol can go all the way to 26 feet when somebody sneezes and stays in the air for hours. Again, if there is low humidity, which is what right now is happening inside building there with heat, you know, you have these particles there of three microns. These are the ones that stays in the air for a long period of time. If you want to spend more time on that, I spent quite a bit of time on this whole area on August 7 video. Fitting the mask is critical. Uh, I showed this earlier in the video there, but you know, uh, clearly an average mask only gave you 50% protection. It's extremely difficult to find the N95, the all reserve for the healthcare worker. Uh, and that's probably the best one there. Surgical mask is only 65%. And it's important to fit it right. I mean, I see people there with the mask under their nose. <laughs> that doesn't do anything. Uh, so please, 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 you know, help educate people around you. Uh, and be aware of the environment there. If it's poorly ventilated and, and people are singing, which is unfortunately part of the holidays there, that's when you are at risk. And it doesn't take much. We saw this thing in a, a two weeks ago in a Korean a restaurant there where people were exposed for five minutes, 26 feet apart, and they got sick. So uh, be aware it's not just six feet. It's you know, how crowded it is. Is it close ventilation? And how much time are you there? And do they have face covering? So uh, please boost your immune system there. Vitamin D3, we talk over this. If there's one thing, take that. I take a quick look at some of the other ones. There's multiple papers. I, re I reviewed this in October there uh, to help you boost your immune system there. If you get exposed, that's one of the way you can fight it. Uh, some study coming up with mouthwash with CPC can help you kill the bacteria if you think you've been exposed. Aspirin, you know, for blood clots. Um, and famotidine boosts your immune system. And this is to help you uh, fight the cytokine storm, the melatonin. So I want to wish you a happy virtual holiday. Stay safe. Uh, my next video is going to be on January the 8th. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I, we cannot wait to finish 2020. And I hope you can enjoy your loved one and stay safe and healthy. And see you in three weeks.